Hey everyone, welcome to another Caternix Corner Live. I'm glad to see we got some people in the chat room already. Uh, with me today is Beth Reed, and she is going to be uh, sharing with us her setup. Uh, she's going to be showing off some of her birds, and uh, also a very interesting mod that she has made uh, to the uh, DIY incubator that we have on the channel. So welcome to the show, Beth. Appreciate you being Thank here. Thank you. Yep. Um, before we get started, uh, as usual, I do have a couple announcements that I'd like to make. Um, first announcement, I just got a phone call from Zach, and uh, he said that all the tickets for QuailCon have been sold out. Um, if you are wanting to come to QuailCon and you need a ticket, um, you can give Zach a call. And Verna, if you would, post um, Zach's phone number over there in the chat. Um, yeah, so if you're if you need a good ticket, give uh, Zach a call, and he said he will get you hooked up. Um, either that or text him over on uh, Facebook on the group page. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, you guys probably noticed there hasn't been a whole lot of new content on the Caternix Corner YouTube channel. Uh, I've been really busy getting ready for the con. Um, I'm also in the process of moving out all my old wood frame cages. Um, I've got most of them sold off to a friend of mine. Um, we're making room for new wire cages that I'm currently in the process of building. And I'm going to be releasing a video on that as soon as I get back from QuailCon. I'll go ahead and get that video edited and get it uploaded to the channel. So I've also got a few other ideas. Um, there's going to be some videos, highlights videos coming from the con. We'll be uploading that after we get back. Um, Let's see, Zach also reported last week on his uh, live stream Sunday that uh, they've made enough in donations to pretty much cover all the expenses uh, that they were behind on for the con, but he is still taking donations. Um, Zach, Jenna, and myself have been talking. We've got a little a special project that uh, we're trying to get funded. Um, and he's going to announce that at the con itself. So if you guys can, um, or if you're willing, uh, make a donation. Uh, there's a dollar sign right underneath the chat window. Just click on that. Any any amount, you know, will help. Um, like I say, we, we've got to get a little bit more money in the kitty just to uh, make this next project happen. Uh, as far as uh, giveaways tonight, I don't have any hatching eggs to give away, but I am going to do one of the Caternix Corner uh, tumblers um, and Verna if you would uh, select one person that uh, has you know the better questions for the night and uh, we'll get that tumbler sent out to them um, also welcome to the um, chat room Verna appreciate you Verna is our moderator she kind of keeps thing in, things in line over there <clears throat> okay um, I think that's about it for the announcements um, Beth, if you would, would you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your quail operation? Well, um, hi, I'm Beth. <laughs> I think uh, most of the regulars are familiar with me by name, if not by face. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm one of the admins for the Newbie Quail Lovers Facebook group, and I'm a moderator on the MyShire Farms YouTube uh, live streams. Um, Verna seems to have it handled in this one, so I just relax and, and watch and uh, don't have to work on Tuesday nights normally. <laughs> um, I have only been keeping quail for about not quite two years now, but I've been keeping poultry for decades. Um, so um, not everything transfers over, but a lot does. So I kind of jumped in fairly experienced in a lot of ways. Um, Right now, I'm fairly small. I've butchered down all of my excess birds. Um, I, at the beginning of the summer, I had almost 30 colors I was working with, wow. and it was working me to death. So, um, because I like to keep everything in very small groups, which means lots of small cages, uh, I try to keep my breeding groups with one male and anywhere from four to eight females, depending on how 
aggressive of a breeder the male is. Mm-hmm. Um, so that many cages was, and multiple cages for each color was, was kind of wiping me out. So I have chosen just a few colors that I'm going to concentrate on now. And, and Terry's got some pictures we'll be showing later of, of some of the birds that that I'm working with right now. But I'm down to uh, four breeding groups at the moment. So I've got just a couple dozen breeders and I have just other than a few oddballs I've got to finish up. I've pretty much butchered everything else at this point or sold everything else. Um, and just kind of taking a break right now. I've got almost 400 quail in the freezer for dog food. So I don't need to hatch anything other than just for the fun of working with colors for a while yet. Sure. Um, and then I'm also working through my chicken and turkey flocks and thinning them out at the moment and uh, and rabbits and it's that time of year. You thin everything down in the fall so that you don't have to feed it all over the winter. Yep. So um, I am in north central Arkansas uh, on the eastern edge of the Ozark Mountains, which is a really beautiful area. We've been here for just a couple years now. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up these uh, photos that you sent me, Beth. Um, guys, there's I think it's one of the first photos that are coming up is uh, a modification she made on the incubator and I'm really uh, excited with that one. Let me go back to the beginning here. Sorry about that. Okay, Beth, if you would go ahead and uh, tell us about these uh, pictures here. Okay, so um, the the photo on the left is uh, a view of the, the inner workings of my incubator. And I started with uh, Terry's do-it-yourself incubator plan um, and basically just made it a little bit taller. Um, my um, my levels are a little closer together than in that original plan. Um, the shelf at the top is where I've got my uh, humidity tray. I use a stainless steel uh, quarter sheet cake pan for that. And you can almost make out in there that uh, what's inside of it, rather than using sponges, which work kind of, uh, I've got uh, a humidifier filter in there, which seems to okay. raise the humidity much more effectively for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't hatch in that incubator, so I don't need light in that incubator um, beyond what comes in the door. So I've used ceramic heat emitters instead of light bulbs. For me, that that uh, I like them better because they last longer. Right. Um, I upsized the computer fans a little bit. I don't remember the specs off the top of my head, but it's a little bit higher RPMs. Um, but other than that, it's it's basically the same incubator. Um, it holds four turners, which in that photo I've got some some set up for chicken eggs and some set up for quail eggs. But I can do uh, 41 chicken eggs per level or 120 quail eggs per level or some combination of that. So I'm able to hatch pretty well. Um, also, if you look at the foam that I've used, instead of using the one inch foam, I use two inch. And um, that helps me maintain the temperature a little little more consistently with the larger space. Right. I've got about a half degree of temperature variation between top and bottom there. So it's, it's close enough to work well for me. Um, I'm getting, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but I do track my percentage rates and it's somewhere right around 80 to 85 percent successful hatch rate in in that incubator. Perfect. Um, And then if you look in the second picture there, um, that is an Inkbird thermostat that you don't have to hardwire. It's uh, it's the lazy person's way of doing that. Mm-hmm. So instead of doing the little built-in uh, one that Terry shows in his video, I use this one that you just plug your heating element into. Okay. Does that one have the same settings as the uh, ITC 1000? Yes. Okay. Yes, you set it exactly the same. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, there's your next one. This is uh, what's commonly called a cooler baiter, and I use it as my hatcher. So it's, um, you can see on the, on the top, on the left-hand side there, it's got one of the other styling bird thermostats mm-hmm. built into the lid. 
and I've inset a uh, the glass from a picture frame on the top to give me a view. Yeah, um, there, yeah. there's the other one. And, and uh, that's actually double layered. There's a second sheet of glass on the inside of the lid. And, how many and then inside, can on this one? I can do one rack from the the main incubator. So I need, I've got the stuff to either build a larger hatcher that would be built on the same style as the DIY incubator that you've made, or I need mm -hmm. to do a, a second or, and third one of these. Right. Um, so about a hundred, hundred and twenty-ish quail eggs or forty some chicken eggs, um, and then I've got the same paper um, humidifier filters in the humidity pan under the bulb on the uh, on the left hand side there. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty simple setup. The the uh, computer fans in that one are very small. They're only about an inch and a half square, but that's plenty of circulation for that small space. Right. And what wattage bulb do you have to use on that one? Um, it's more of a problem with it overheating than staying warm. So oh, really? that one's just a, a 25 watt. Okay. Cool. And this is what I use for my breeding cages. I have uh, several of these now. Um, automatic waterers. The feeders you can't quite make out. Um, they're on the left-hand side, just above the uh, the lip of the. I'm pointing to them like you can see what I'm pointing at. Uh, just <laughs> above the the lip of the the uh, tray there, um, kind of set back into the frame, and they're a piece of sewer pipe that's been cut to fit, and then uh, a slot cut out for them to right. to reach in. Um, I I don't care for wire floors, not so much bumblefoot, although. It definitely can contribute to that, but but I think they're happier with bedding, um, mm -hmm. and um, I use the pelleted pine bedding that you can kind of make out there. Uh, it's sold for horse stall bedding, and with a single breeding group per level, of, you know, usually somewhere around six to eight birds, um, I only have to change it about once a week, and it uh, it stays pretty clean and dry um, over the course of that week it goes from being pellets to kind of sawdust mm -hmm. but at, by the time it's sawdust it's kind of, it's starting to become a little bit damp which is when I change it um, so they kick it up a little bit but it's not dusty enough to cause respiratory problems right. what size is each one of them units um, the the trays that are in the bottom of it are the ones that are s sold for storing stuff underneath a bed, mm -hmm. and they are um, about 26 inches long and 16 inches front to back, okay. and uh, six inches or so high. So it works out to roughly three square feet per level. Perfect. All right. I like this. This is one of my ground pins. Um, I've this is the first one I built. I have changed the way that I do them since then. So one thing that I did not like about this one, um, first of all, the house on the end was too large to be easily portable. So I have changed that and made it. That one's two foot square, which is way more room than I need for the number of birds I put in them. Hmm. Um, and then, um, so I've got one by two uh, houses on on the later ones that I built and uh, the little run area is two feet wide two feet high and eight foot long um, the newer one also has uh, a, a top loading door at each end but it's not all the way at the end because I've discovered that when quail flush up they tend to do it in the corners so it it makes it, I still occasionally have one that gets past me, but um, I have fewer escapees with them on the corners and with one door on each end, it's easier to reach and catch them in there. Um, gotcha. This I this photo I took uh, the day that I completed that, it's made mostly from salvage lumber. Um, since then I have hung the, the feeder from one of the, the cross supports and set up an automatic waterer for it as well. Okay. And uh, 
the the house on that one's kind of heavy and awkward to move but other than that they're fairly easy to scoot over a couple of feet if the ground starts getting dirty All right you can oh, you can see in that that it's covered with chicken wire the reason I can get away with that is because the entire area is surrounded by electric netting okay I think I see it behind the, the house there yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, you can nice. barely make out one of my ostrilorps in the background, I think. This is the main... Oh, yeah, there he is the right main... there in the corner. Yep. <laughs> okay, let me go back to your bird. So I'm kind of concentrating on blue quail right now. Um, not blue scale quail, which is different, but blue caternix. And these are some of the first blue birds that I started working with. Um... I typically keep all blue hens with a uh, either a pharaoh or a Tibetan male or a blue rooster with Tibetan or pharaoh hens. Um, blue to blue gives you kind of a solid white washed out dingy looking bird that I'm not crazy about. So this is one of my blue pharaohs. Um, you can see his, his pharaoh markings on his back, and uh, this is the, the breeder male in one of my groups right now. I'm uh, trying to perfect the coloring so it's not quite so blotchy. But they're, they're beautiful birds. And this is yeah, uh, this one of the hens. Yes, she's, she's a pretty girl. Um, this is uh, on a Tibetan base. Nice. Uh, I like them. Okay. Um, that was very interesting. Um, okay, guys. Um, for, I see we just got a few more people that just popped in here. Actually, quite a few more people. Um, reminder, hit that like button, guys. It kind of helps the algorithms for the channel. And uh, the YouTube will show the video more in your uh, recommended videos if we get uh, a lot of interactivity going on. So um, hit the like button. I see we already got a thumbs down. So I think the guy that I pissed off last week is still here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't know what I did, but somebody keeps hitting that down button. Um, but for you new guys, um, guys, we are still taking donations for QuailCon. So if you um, would like to make a donation, the uh, dollar sign down there below the chat window. Uh, it's much appreciated. The money's going over to Zach at Myshire. He's going to be um, working on a special project. I don't want to say any more than that. But uh, yeah, that's the last thing that we've got to get uh, uh, taken care of. So any donations is much appreciated. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we needed to say about QuailCon. I think Zach pretty much covered everything Sunday uh, that he was talking about and last week when he was on the show he was talking we did a, a full show just about QuailCon. So um, one of the topics that came up last week on uh, the live stream here was we were talking about service dogs and Beth has a good understanding of service dogs. Do you uh, train service dogs or something Beth? And uh, I have been protocol? training service dogs for uh, about 15 years now, not quite 15 years. I've been a professional dog trainer for about 30. Oh, wow. And then I have my wow. own service dog. Okay. Um, so what is the service dog protocol as far as going to this kind <laughs> Um Well, the main thing is don't distract a service dog. Um, and there's lots of ways that you can do that. But um, a service dog is there specifically to keep its handler safe, um, whether that's to help help you avoid a fall, um, signal that, you know, if you're diabetic that your blood sugar is dropping, signal that a seizure is oncoming. Um, there's a lot of different jobs that service dogs do, everything from people with PTSD to prevent them from having a panic attack to... Um, to catching a heart attack before it happens. Um, really? Just about any right. disability that you can think of, there's a way that a service dog can mitigate that. But they can't do it if they're distracted from their handler. Okay. So one thing that all of us that have service dogs deal with every time that we go out with them is people who want to talk to the dog, pet the dog, yeah. um, 
take photos of the dog, which is incredibly rude. It's like taking a picture of somebody's wheelchair. Just, just yeah. don't, you know, I'm, I'm it's medical equipment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was too back before I needed one myself or right. learn more about them. Um, it's, it's kind, well-meaning dog loving people that mm. cause problems for service dogs. Most of the right. time, um, the best thing to do is pretend that they're not there. Just ignore them. Um, if you, if you've, really feel the urge to um, dog talk to the handler and not the dog because mm -hmm. listening to you distracts them from their work. Some handlers in some situations may allow you to pet their dog. There are times when I can with mine and times when I can't. So if, if you really want to interact with mine when we're there, talk to me and ask me. And it may be possible at that moment, it may not. It just depends on what's going on with my health at that moment. And it, if we say no, it's not about you. It's about us and our health. Right. You got any tips for me and my idiot dog? How do I keep, get him to behave? Because he, this is his first trip. He's, he's a one-year-old uh -huh. puppy, and he's an, he can be an idiot sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, he's he's Lab Shepherd, right? Yeah. Yeah, at a year old, he is still very much a puppy, and he will be for another year or maybe longer. Right. Um, so we have a tendency when our dogs look like adults to expect them to act like adults. And sometimes the best thing you can do is prevent the opportunity to mess up, mm -hmm. you know, which is why leashes are handy and crates are handy and, and all of those things, because you can stop a bad habit from starting. One other thing I wanted to mention about service dogs before we moved on too much from that, and I'm happy to take questions about that as well. Most people also don't realize what an investment a service dog is. The average in the United States for a very basic level service dog is $20,000 in two years of training. Um, for dogs that require additional training where they're doing something very specialized and very hard to train, it can be up to $60,000. Wow. And it takes one traumatic event in public to ruin them where they can never be used in public again. Um, so please be, just in general, be, be aware that right. what seems minor to you can be major. There was a woman in Colorado recently who was approached by someone who was determined to touch her service dog and to pet it, and she told them no because he was working and and didn't need to be distracted, and the person persisted, and the woman had a seizure that the dog did not alert her to, and oh, yeah. fell and hit her head and was in the hospital for about four days. Wow. So, you know, it, it you can't look at somebody and tell what their health issues are and whether distraction is a problem or not, so just assume it will be. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's just like a, a police canine. You know, if you go up and try to pet mm -hmm. one of them, the cop's not going to let you. You know, he's going to warn you, stay back right. with my dog. So. Right. <clears throat> okay, yeah, if you guys have any questions on uh, on uh, service dog etiquette, um, go ahead and post them. I see we're getting quite a few questions in there, and I do want to get started on them because we're going to run out of time if we don't. Um, guys, if you do have a question, uh, please post the uh please type the letter Q in front of your questions that just just so I know that it's a question and not just a, a comment um, I see that we do have two donations uh, looks like uh, Ron uh, has made a donation and Robin has made another donation um, I think Ron I think you've, you've donated uh, this is a second or third time for you too so um, guys we really appreciate it uh, like I said that uh, all donations are going to go to Zach and uh, He's going to get this last project taken care of uh, before QuailCon gets here. So, all right, let me jump up top here. Um, start uh, getting some questions. Uh, Yeti says hello, welcome. Uh, Jeff says hello, greetings from uh, Central Missouri, welcome. My neighbor to the north. There you go. Uh, Ten EC here, hello all. Brandon Smith says, hey, all new to the quail world here. Welcome. I'm sure you're get, going to enjoy it. <laughs> get ready, Brandon. It's addictive. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Bernie Young says, evening, everyone. Uh, 
Uh, Ron Alvarez says, hi everyone from South Carolina and in three weeks moving to Pennsylvania. So we'll be very busy and still go to QuailCon. Good, can't wait to, uh, to meet you there, Ron. It's going to be such a good time to finally put faces with all these names. Exactly, yep. Uh, Joan says hello from Southern Arizona. Uh, and yeah, guys, I'm going to be going around um, at the con after we get, after I get done with my little talk I got to do. Um, I'm going to be going around talking with people, just taking pictures, short video clips and whatnot, because when I get back, I want to do a, uh, a highlights video. So uh, I point the camera at you. Don't get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Katrina says hi to everyone from Gilroy, California. Uh, Katrina says, Terry, do your aviary coil lay in a particular place or do they lay wherever they happen to be at the moment? Uh, I have like four birds that are laying all inside a little nest box type deal that I made, um, but pretty much all the other ones are just wherever they want. So, uh, In the ground pins that you showed earlier of mine, mm -hmm. most of my hens will lay in the little house and the ones that don't, it's almost always a corner. Okay. Uh, let's see, Ron says, hi Verna, I saw somewhere you talked about AOL and TOS. I retired Coast Guard with much law enforcement, but never heard of those letters. Oh, what are they? Um, America Online and Terms of Service. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't know what America Online would have to do with, uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, Everyday Oil Mommy says hello from Sacramento, California. Hello and welcome. Okay, and there's our, you were right, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that conversation with Verna too. <laughs> oh, have you? Uh, yeah. Delena says hello everyone. Hello, Delena. Welcome. Uh, let's see, not for me, not for me. Orlando says hello from Phoenix City, Alabama. Oh, another thing real quick, guys, that I forgot to mention, um, and I had a, a private message come in through Facebook earlier today uh, regarding the Coternix Corner classifieds. Um, guys, I'm not trying to run you off of the Coternix Corner Facebook group page as far as posting ads. I'm just trying to save the group from getting terminated by Facebook. Um, and the only way I can think to do that is to give you guys a place to post your ads and then share them right from the uh, um, classifieds. You can share them right to Facebook, and that's not going to get us in trouble. But if you've got your own domain or you've got another place that you can post an ad, um, you can do that and you can share the link. Facebook's not going to you know, punish us for sharing links, so um, I just want to throw that out there. Uh, okay, Whiskey Tango Farm says hello from Central Wisconsin. Who's excited for QuailCon? I think everybody I am. is. <laughs> uh, welcome, Kristen and Brandon. I'm sure you're in there somewhere. Um, let's see. Okay. S.O. Swanson says Memphis is in the house. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Uh, Robert uh, says, hello, guys. My name's Robert. I'm from Oklahoma, and I really appreciate all the information you guys put out. Uh, I'll put out there. I'm just getting started in Coternix. You're going to love it. Build more cages. Mm-hmm. More cages, bigger incubators, bigger hatchers, yep. bigger brooders. Yep. <laughs> Adirondack Quail Farm says hello from New York. Hello. Oh, this is good. Ron wants to know what is QuailCon. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure Ron knows what QuailCon is. Uh, I think he says, asked that wait. same question Sunday. Yeah, did he? Okay. Uh, I can't wait to get into this lovely hobby. It looks like so much fun and rewarding. Uh, yes, it is. Um, and there's a lot of great people that are in this hobby. Um, I would recommend going over to Facebook if you're on Facebook and check out uh, Newbie Quail Lovers, um, Coternix Corner. Um, there's some other ones. Any other ones that you're part of, uh, Beth, that you recommend? Well, we have an Arkansas Coternix Quail Breeders group now. Okay, I never um, it's heard fairly of new. Well, it's brand new. Um, I think less than a month old, probably. Mm -hmm. um, there's one on. There's a lot. There's a lot of regional ones. 
Yeah. Um, there's yeah, there's Caternix quail colors and genetics. It's, yep. it's very good. Okay, uh, I see. And then there's uh, a lot Yeti by specific made. breeders. I see Yeti just made a uh, donation. Thank you, Yeti. Um, I got I got a quick. I'm not trying to talk over you, Beth. I'm, I just if I don't catch them, I'll miss them. So no, go I'm right ahead. Watching those screens. Okay. I can talk quail all day. You're going to have to yeah. shut me up from time to time. <laughs> Uh, Verna says, Whiskey Tango Farms, uh, 11 days until I meet you two. Okay, yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And she says, Verna, can't wait. Jesse Mills says, good evening, everyone. There's Brandon. I knew he was in here. Uh, hello, everyone, from Brandon. Kristen <laughs> and Brandon's new live stream has been really good, by the way. If if you guys yeah. aren't all catching that one, be sure and watch it on Wednesday nights yep, at the same tomorrow time. Tomorrow night at uh, 7 o'clock Central Time, uh, 8 o'clock Eastern. Um, yeah, check them out and help them build their channel up. Uh, let see. Robert says, how long do you retire your hens before you start replacing them with new ones? Go ahead, ben, uh, Beth. Well, with mine... It depends on which bloodline you're talking about. So my my jumbos get retired when their daughters are bigger than they are, um, or better suit my my goals, which is mm -hmm. uh, good heavy bone as well as good size and consistent laying ability. So when when the young stock is better than the old stock, the hens get replaced, and so usually that's that's pretty consistently, you know, nine months to a year. Yep. I've, I've got enough improvement that I'm replacing birds. Um, I typically do an all in, all out on my breeder cages, so I replace mm -hmm. males at the same time. Okay. Um, my blues, as long as they are closer to my goal than, than the other birds, they stay in there. So sometimes with the blues, they might stick around a little longer. Yeah, mine, um, at least on my jumbos, uh, usually the hens are around for about a year and the, the roosters about six to eight months, depending. Or, or if I notice that they start, production starts going down a little bit, I'll uh, bring in some new blood. Right. Uh, let's see, Rep Scallion says, are quail cons facilities accessible to little people, AKA midgets? Um, I don't know. I know that Zach was Zach working on, you. yeah, I know Zach was working on accessibility for other disabilities, uh, including walkers and wheelchairs and service dogs, obviously, um, but I don't know if that's something that crossed his mind or not. Okay. Uh, yeah, just check with Zach, or even Kristen may know. Um, right here is Kristen's uh, Whiskey Tangle Farm, says hello, Beth. <laughs> Hi, Kristen. Enjoyed visiting with you earlier. Okay, Verna says, evening, Terry and Beth. Good evening, Verna. Hi, Verna. Uh, Jen says, hello. Hello. Okay, guys, here's Zach's number. It's 937-760-7282. Um, if you are looking to get a ticket for QuailCon, uh, if you go to the website, it's going to show that the tickets are all sold out. But just contact Zach at that number, and uh, he will get you hooked up so you can get a ticket. Uh, little Lucky Chimmy says hello. Uh, let's see. Uh, Doug says my internet is in and out tonight. I'm having the same issue over here, Doug. Luckily, knock on wood, I haven't lost it yet, but we've got thunderstorms going on out there, and Comcast is just no good in the rain. Dan says, hey, mate, I had no luck with my last hatch. Do you think it could have been the fact that the Australian post held my eggs for 14 days? I would say that's a very good <laughs> yeah. uh, reason why you had a bad hatch. Uh, Val says, hello from the UK. Hello, Val. Welcome. Okay, guys, we've got 65 people in the watching now and only 42 likes. Go ahead and hit that thumbs up if you would. Appreciate it. Uh, Katrina says, I will be getting a homemade rabbit hutch, which I may use as a grow out cage. I know the height is important. I know height is important, either 12 or 18 inches or more than six foot. 
what is the tallest short height I can adjust it um, all my cages my inside cages anyhow are about 12 feet at uh, 12 feet 12 inches <laughs> um, Wow <laughs> yeah they I give them lots of room to fly uh, but outside um, it's my aviary is six foot high and I haven't had any issues with it yet so my ground pins are two feet um, and that's because I hang buckets inside that for my waterers and feeders uh, and that's the height that I needed to make that work and okay. since I've been keeping quail that way I've lost one to flushing up and hitting his head right. but I didn't stretch the roof real tight on it either so there's a little bit of give there right. um, yeah, my inside I've cages are about 14 inches are they? Uh, when mm -hmm. I first put the birds out in the aviary they had been raised up in, a, in an indoor uh, grow up pen moved them outside and every one of them flew up they didn't hit the ceiling but they hit the walls mm -hmm. like they were trying to fly away and yeah they definitely do a lot more of that when they first move into a new setting whether it's going from the brooder to the cages right. or yep. or to a ground pen once yep. they settle in yep. they're usually uh, fine frosty says hi when did you get your very first quail from dallas texas oh i don't know Two and a half, three years ago, uh, when I first got into them, I, I, I like Beth um, had all other forms of poultry for years prior to quail. Um, but where I'm at, we're limited on the number of chickens that we can have. We're only allowed four hens, no roosters. So I decided to get out of chickens altogether and uh, just got into quail. I've had them for, I think I got my first hatching eggs in February of last year. So, about a year and a half. Okay. Rapscallion says, what's the right age to butcher extra males? Eight weeks? Yeah, that'll work. Um, anywhere between yeah. eight and ten. I sometimes even butcher them at six. It just Do you? Depending on what yeah. my schedule's like. And the vast majority of the birds that I butcher go to the dog, not to us. Um, okay. We primarily feed him raw food. So, um, we do a bloodless call and just freeze them hole and, and it just takes a couple of minutes to, to do that um, so it's whenever I can work myself up to go and put down a bunch of birds basically right I, my dog will not eat raw quail I, I have really? to cook him I have to cook him that's the only way he loves them cooked but or boiled hmm. but he will not touch them uh, I mean when I'm outside butchering you know I'll feed them with like, mm -hmm. the hearts and whatnot He'll take them right. sometime, or he'll grab the feet and run off with the feet, but he won't eat a whole mm -hmm. bird for some reason. Zeke will eat about three at a meal, usually. Wow. I wish my dog would. Save me on dog food. <laughs> I see. Corey says, just hatched our first batch. Congratulations. We have a really aggressive chicks, drags the others around. What can we do with them? Is this in the incubator? Yeah. Yeah, I think, or in the, in the brooder. I have the chicks do that, too. You'll get one that's you know, yeah. they'll get their, grab their feet and want to drag them around and... I don't... Yeah. I, I put mine on the the pine pellets from day one. Mm -hmm. So I don't get that on the pellets. I think the, the toes are kind of hidden in the pellets. Yeah. And they... The pellets are too big for them to ingest until they are old enough that they've already figured out what food is. Gotcha. Um, I get it in the incubator some, and I just cover the window so it's dark in there, and then they settle down. Mm -hmm. Okay, Everyday Oil Mommy says, uh, question, will my young hens stop laying when the days shorten? Yes, they will. Well, most likely mm -hmm. they will. Uh, they They'll at least slow down. August. You're right. Uh, they hatched in July and August. If I hatch more in October, what kind of laying can I expect for outdoor cage birds with no extra lighting November and December? Ahead, if they're it. old enough, if they're old enough that they've started laying consistently before the days get significantly shorter, they'll continue for for a while. They may not continue until spring, though. Hmm. Um, okay. I use uh, for for birds that are outside. I like to use those little cheap one dollar steak solar lights okay. that you can buy at like Dollar Tree or whatever. Yeah. And I take the stake off of them, and you can set them in the roof of your, your quail pen. Um, and when it gets dark, 
they they'll last for several hours but usually the batteries in them are weak enough they don't last all night so you can extend the day without making it too too long right i think chris does the same thing from uh slightly redneck i think he does those same things with the solar lights okay katrina you gotta get the cheap ones <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, Beth, what is the value of the color varieties besides the different color feathers? Also, can you sell? Also, can you sell color feathers better than wild? Oh, okay, that better than wild color feathers. The value is that I think they're gorgeous, and I just mm -hmm. enjoy them. Um, and in my market, people want jumbo wilds more than anything else. No, nope. and the bigger the better. That's that's just where I am. Um, we're in a somewhat impoverished part of the state, uh, and people don't usually throw money at quail as a hobby as much as, as a way to, to provide their own meat and eggs. Right. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, so I do get a little bit more for a breeding group of blues or pearl fees or whatever. Uh, than I do for a group of, of jumbo wilds, but I don't sell as many of them. Right. You know, I may take the same group to the poultry swap several times before it sells. Yep. Okay, Orlando says, question, how do you identify what type of quail you have? I have 50 three-week-old chicks. Most look like jumbos. Not three weeks. I have a couple that look like tuxedo and some not sure. They were from free eggs that I got. Uh, easiest way is going to let would, them grow out a little bit, you know, to see exactly what yep. you have. And I would suggest going to the Newbie Quail Lovers group on Facebook or the Quail Caternix Quail Colors and Genetics group and posting photos and asking. Yep. yep. At um, three to also, six weeks, uh, they're usually easy to tell. What's his name? Um, 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 Southwest Game Birds. Uh, Michael has on his website um, pictures of the color and then the chick next to it so you can kind of see what that color will look like as a chick yeah there's a lot of them that look a whole lot alike until they feather out yep. though yep <laughs> brooke says hey beth great to see you and have your knowledge thank you brooke uh jasmine says hello fellow quail fanatics and friends i'm so glad i didn't miss you uh at beth reed thank you jasmine the La Rochelle Farm says, QuailCon, what's that? <laughs> uh, I know you know. Are you coming to QuailCon, La Rochelle Farm? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't heard. Uh, Dan Nicholson says, oh, he's talking to Verna, sorry. Anytime. Katrina says, that cooler setup is pretty awesome. Yep. Yeah, I probably have less than $50 in that top to bottom. Um, and, and it's really nice for Hatcher because it's so easy to disinfect. It's all hard surfaces and easy to wipe down. Right. Yeah, and for those of you who are going to QuailCon, um, I'm, an, I'm gonna be uh, doing a talk on DIY projects, but it's gonna be heavy on the uh, cabinet incubator. We're actually gonna build a model there. Um, and I did make a lot of modifications not a, not major modifications but i did make modifications to the uh cabinet incubator that has not been covered on videos yet so um yeah that should be pretty interesting you know to any of you guys that are using that incubator uh yeti says how much does it cost to make these incubator what do you, what do you got the wrapped biggest up in yours uh, well, the biggest expense is the turners uh, mm -hmm. for me, and I had three of those already. So, um, you know, again, top to bottom for the one that I built, I probably have about $100 in it, but I had parts that I could use from other things that I mm -hmm. pulled over. So yeah. um, if I was building it from scratch, those turners are, what, about $40 a piece, I think? Yeah, I, th oh, I just so. bought... Sub they were fifty dollars, forty nine dollars for the turners, plus twenty dollars for a set of quail rails. So. Right. Now some of those jumbo eggs fit just fine in a chicken rail. Good. Yeah. You can't get as many in there, but. 
let's see here's a question for you Beth from Katrina it says uh, how long do your humidifier filters last in there do you have to change them at some point yes because they are paper and aluminum so eventually the paper starts kind of falling apart on you um, goodness I couldn't even tell you I I bought one big package of of, um, of those humidifier filters last summer and I still have some that I haven't used mm -hmm. so it's it's not a constant thing to change them out um, and now that I have the separate hatcher I'm not going through them as fast because I do mostly a dry incubation um, if it drops below about 20 percent humidity I'll, I'll add a little water but other than that I just leave it alone right yep same here um, here's a good question. Brandon says, I have a new chick that seems to be having a hard time and his head is stuck down against his body. Will he recover or will it be better to put him down? I usually, on chicks like that, I just put them down. It's not worth the effort to try to bring them around. Um, My rule of thumb with chicks with problems is if they can eat and drink and gain weight and keep up with everybody else, I give them a chance. If if it's going to take me hand feeding them to get them to eat, I just cull them. Right. And and regardless, if they have problems in the brooder, they don't make it into the breeding pens. Gotcha. Okay, Val says, I don't care for wire floors. I love to see them in fresh bedding. Yep. Yeah, I noticed the birds that, are, that I have out in the aviary seem, a, I won't say happier, but they seem to be perkier than the ones that are inside in the cages you know they're just they, look they do like a lot less themselves. of just random running around and they do more bathing in the shavings yeah. and more natural activity I think yep uh, Jordan says for jumbo meat birds at what week do you stop feeding the 30% protein and switch to something with less protein to minimize feed cost versus growth and weight um, I feed my Meat pen, all my meat pen birds are on a 30% protein, protein until they are butchered. Um, I don't know what you do, Beth. Um, well, it depends on whether it's breeder pen or meat pen. Um, if I'm raising them for replacement hens, um, they stay on, I feed 28%, but they stay on that until I get my first egg. Mm -hmm. And then I mix them with a, um, a chicken layer crumble until everybody's laying and then I switch them over. So there's usually about a week of transition time there. Yeah, yeah I do I do the same thing for <laughs> birds that I'm gonna keep. Uh, right, you know, and, and like Terry, if they're meat birds, they get the high protein stuff until they go right in the freezer. Your day, yeah. uh, Chris says, good evening from Arkansas, good evening. Hello. Scallion says, nice setup. Uh, Val says, are they kept outdoor pen overnight? Okay, Mine are. Little are they? Once they move outside, they stay outside until cold weather. And I don't bring them in because they're not fine with cold weather. I bring them in because I'm not fine with cold weather. Right. So I don't want to mess with watering outdoors in the cold any more than I have to. I hear you. Orlando says, is your outside setup a tractor or stationary? If it's a tractor, how often do you move it? It's a tractor. Um, how often I move it depends on how I'm feeling physically and how many birds are in it and whether I can get help to move it or, or not and all of those kinds of details. There have been a few times when I'm down in my back or something when I've actually gone out and put bedding in them for a few days until I'm able to move it. Right. On average, it's probably a couple of weeks between moves, but I don't crowd them a whole lot either. Um, okay. There's usually about one bird for every two square feet, roughly. No, I'm sorry, I'm saying that backward. Two birds for every one square foot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are about halfway through. I am going to make a couple quick announcements for the new people that are just joining us. Um, as far as quail con goes, if you go over to myshirefarm.com, you will notice that the quail con tickets are sold out. But Zach called me today and said that if anybody wants tickets, they can call him and he will hook you up with tickets. Uh, Verna, if you would put the Zach's phone number up there again. I don't have, I should have wrote it down. But uh, yeah, just give Zach a call and uh, he'll get you hooked up with tickets. 
Um, also, uh, we're still taking um, donations for QuailCon. We got one last project that we're trying to fund. And uh, I'm not going alive again until after QuailCon. So this is the last live stream here. And I told Zach tonight that any money that we bring in uh, from three weeks ago, last two weeks ago, last week, and this week, all that money is going to him um, for this new project that he's working on. So guys, if you're feeling like you want to donate, it would be much appreciated. And I will make sure that that money gets over to Zach. So, okay, let's jump back into the questions. Uh, third time around says, oh no, I'm late. Hope I didn't miss much. Um, you did miss some, but um, you can watch the replay. <laughs> Robin says uh, she is gorgeous. I think she's talking about that last bird. That, the blue uh, quail, yeah. She yeah. is a beautiful bird. Yep. Val says love the blues. Uh, Rick A says at what age can you tell whether they are hens or roosters? I believe he's talking about your colored birds. The blue ones have to be vent sexed. So... Um, the um, so I've talked to a couple of people that say they can tell at like two and a half three weeks vent sexing I can't do it yet mm -hmm. in another ten years maybe I will but not now so I usually sex them around six six weeks seven weeks right. um, now I can't say this about blues in general but the ones that I have are very docile and I typically have less fighting in the blue cages than I do with anything else so I can leave them together a bit longer before they start scalping each other. Okay, uh, we just got another super chat from Verna, $5. QuailCon will be great. Yes, it will, and thank you very much, Verna. Okay, uh, Delana says, uh, that's okay, it still counts, Terry. Okay, I'm not sure what counts, but uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Must have been a comment from earlier. Yeah, I'm sure it was. S.O. <laughs> Swanson says, what factors do you use to make your selection for colors uh, to work on? Do you try to make an original color? Um, well, I work on Jumbo Wilds because that's what the greatest demand is, and I work on Blues because I love them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my my version. Now I have a mental picture of the blue I want to end up with and I'm working to to get the color the way that I want it and to get it to I won't say breed true because I don't breed blue to blue but I want the the blues that I get to be fairly consistent mm -hmm. um, and then I once I get the color where I want it then I'll work on some size. So that's a long-term project. Yep. Uh, Robin C's, uh, okay, $5 super chat from Robin, uh, see you in Ohio. Thank you very much, Robin. Much appreciated. I know you have donated uh, multiple times already, so thank you very much. Uh, it's not for me. Um, okay, here's the super chat from Ron. Uh, we appreciate it, Ron. That 20 bucks will go to a good cause. Okay, Delana says, is there any health issues for humans or the birds associated with keeping the birds in cages in your home? Um, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I keep a lot of birds, of like 300 birds in an enclosed carport that measures uh, 27 by 12. And I can tell you when there's a lot of bird dander or dust that it doesn't really bother me, but my wife's got some breathing issues and it, I'm afraid it can bother her. But I do have good mm -hmm. ventilation in there. I've got air movement all the time. I've got exhaust fans. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, be careful with it, especially yeah. if you have any type of health issues. There's also a risk of salmonella if you don't keep them clean, particularly their waterer. Uh, aspergillosis if you, if you allow mold and such to build up. But if you're keeping them well, you shouldn't have a problem. Okay, third time around, says I'm getting different colors out of my brown wilds. How can I figure out what all these colors are and would they be reproducible? Um, if they happened once, they can happen again. Yeah. Uh, obviously, um, you had some colored uh, bloodlines bred in with your wilds. So. 
a lot of people use the wild coloration to clean up other bloodlines mm -hmm. and so you can often get a visually wild bird that is carrying lots of recessives um, again I'd say go to Facebook the either the newbie quail lovers group or the Caternix quail colors and genetics group post pictures and ask yep and uh, Allie from Maine's confetti quail farm she is getting very good with these colors and genetics she's been posting yes. uh, pictures on some of the various groups that show you know all the different colors and, and what the chicks look like so yeah Kristen from too. whiskey tango farms has been doing some of that as well <clears throat> yep uh, I don't really like this comment but I will put it up there Ritka says poor dog has to live without any affection um, he gets all dogs. the affection he needs from me <laughs> right and they're working dogs that's what they do I mean they they live yes. to make you happy by doing their work you know, working breeds do that well, and he is with me all the time. He gets to go places other dogs don't get to go. He gets sure. love and affection sure. and attention from me. He doesn't need it from strangers. Exactly. Okay, only one says, how should you compost quail manure? How do you do yours, uh, Beth? Um, I do it the lazy way. I pile it up with the bedding and let it sit for however long it takes. Um, if you're exactly. wanting to do it the fastest way, it's, it would be considered a green because there's so much nitrogen in it, so you'd need to layer it with lots of browns. Mm -hmm. I do it the same way you do. I just pile it up, and four to six months later, it's ready to go in the garden. We've got 10 acres. We can get it far enough from us not to smell it. <laughs> I don't really have an issue with, with uh, any smells from mine, but I have a very large population of the black soldier fly, and they keep uh. that turned down pretty good. And so Swanson says parents will have to have a discussion with their children regarding the service dogs. We know how children love dogs. Um, yes, we would really appreciate that. Yep. Uh, Val says, uh, is there a particular breed of dog that you train? I have MS and would benefit immensely. Um, there are there are service dogs of about just any, pretty much any breed you can think of. Um, everything from from tiny little chihuahuas that do hearing alerts or uh, diabetic alerts or things like that to uh, Great Dane Mastiff mixes that help with balance and mobility. Um, so you can find a dog that will suit you. <coughs> the issue is more finding the dog with the right temperament than finding the right breed. Um, now, the breeds that have the highest number of successful service dogs tend to be Labs, Golden Retrievers, and Standard Poodles. You said Poodle? Standard size Poodles, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, we are, after QuailCon, going up to Michigan. My sister's dog had puppies about six weeks ago now, I think it was. But we're picking up one of the Poodles and bringing it back with us. Oh, fun. Yeah. Well, I got to have a dog to train my big idiot dog. <laughs> I figured a poodle was smart. You know, they they should be able to. They are smart. Right. Let's see. Yeti says, "How do you know when to transition new birds outside when it starts to get cold?" Um, Beth, I'm going to let you take that. I got to run in the other room a minute, but go ahead and answer that okay. question. I'll be right back. Well, um, what I do is I wait until they're fully feathered, uh, so generally about three weeks old. Um, I want to see the heads feathered as well as the body. And then at that point, I begin um, acclimating them to the cold. So my brooders are inside a, um, a building that is heated. So I'll start uh, when they reach that age where it's time to start transitioning them outside. I'll start opening the overhead garage door in that building during the daytime and leaving them inside at night. And I'll do that for several days and then uh, or closing it again at night and then after I've done that for several days to kind of transition them to the change in temperatures then I go ahead and move them out usually they're outside by four weeks right if I'm moving them out but again I, I prefer to put mine inside where it's easy in the winter time okay uh, Chris says I follow Victoria Stillwell for training advice I don't know she who is Victoria very good is. Yeah, um, oh, she's a trainer dog trainer 
She yeah, she's got a, a dog show or a TV show. Um, okay. I think it's on Discovery Channel or Nat Geo, one of those. Um, there are lots of good trainers out there, and and there are lots of bad trainers out there. You just gotta find the one that works with you. Right. Uh, Robin says you wouldn't ask somebody to sit in their wheelchair. True. Yeah, people tend to look at at my dog when I'm out and think of it as just a very clever pet. But he's not a pet. He is medical equipment. And so if you yep. can keep that in your head, it's a little easier to sure. to keep sure. your hands off. <clears throat> yep. Yeti says, uh, what is the best quail for eggs and meat? Jumbo Wilds. Absolutely. Uh, there are others that, that might okay. lay a little better, but... Mm -hmm. um, Jumbo Wilds are consistently good layers, if right. not the very best layers, and they are the best combination of meat and eggs. Right. Uh, Delray says, Arkansas here, um, how do you track and cull your older birds? Um, go ahead and take that one, Beth. <laughs> I leg band. Um, do you? So, I, yeah, I use those little four-inch colored zip ties. So... Um, and and again, it's an all in all out for me with mm -hmm. my breeders. So um, the whole group will be of the same age that's in one pen. So I I will know like the red group is going to be ready to cull in October or whatever. And at that point, I just go do the whole group. Yep. Yeah. Mine kind of kind of the same way. When production goes down, I'll usually call them out and replace them with you know new birds. So. Right. Uh, I don't have a set uh, schedule to do it on, I guess I'd say. Uh, Jordan mm -hmm. says, I have four hatching time layers for partridge. If I decide to go with different birds than quail, what are my other options for meat birds for that size of a cage? Hmm. I don't know. Well, some of the Bantam chickens would fit that size cage. Um, right. But I don't really think of bantams when I think about meat birds. Um, I mean, they're all made out of chicken, but um, let's see. You let's could see do your pigeons you and that's... raise squab. Yeah, I don't know if you'd get any more out of a pigeon than you would a quail, would you? No, um, the breast is bigger. The, oh, the, is it? There's yeah. no there's no thigh to speak of, so it's it's all just right. breast. Okay, Rep Scallion says, what's the best angle to use in a rollout cage to make the eggs roll easy? I do, it's, let's see, it's, it's two inches in 24, so it's one, one inch drop per foot. Do you have rollout cages? Nope. On yours? No? Okay. I, I use those solid floor cages. That's right. Orlando says, to have a breeding cage, can I put 15 hens and three males in one cage, or is it better to have five to one in separate cages. I do the, the 15 and three in my, in my uh, breeder cages, the smaller breeder cages. Um, and I do five to one. Um, <laughs> it, it depends on your goals. I'd like to track my genetics more closely than that. Yeah. So. <laughs> Orlando says, at what point will you call it an addiction? <laughs> <laughs> when I can't afford to feed them anymore. Exactly. Uh, Yeti, oh, okay, Yeti gave us a super chat. Um, thank you for all the great information you guys share. Uh, thank you, Yeti. Yeah, <laughs> Verna says, uh, when you have more chicks than room. <laughs> That's an issue for Verna because she keeps hers in an apartment. I know, it's crazy. Uh, Troy says, hey all, Troy from Arkansas? Johnson County. Okay. I have family in Johnson County. Billy says, from the quail shed, Apalaika, Apalaika Allah. I don't know what that means, but. Opalaika, Alaska, I believe. Oh, is it? Okay. I think so. Third time around says, what is QuailCon and where? Um, okay, if you don't know, QuailCon is a gathering that Whiskey Tango Farms and My Shire Farms um, are putting together 
a uh, bunch of quail people all getting together for a day and we're going to have uh, talks, there's going to be vendors, there's just all kinds of stuff going on um, and it's in Miamisburg, Ohio. I remembered it this time. Right, at Myshire Farm. Yeah, you can go to myshirefarm.com, all the information's there on their uh, channel, or, or on their website, but uh, there are no more tickets available unless you uh, call Zach to uh, to get them. You can't order them through the website anymore. Uh, Salvador says, hello everyone from Puerto Rico. Hello, sir, thank you for stopping by. Yep. And Verna put the link up there again. So here's Here's the link. Uh, Robert says, can you tell me if a hen lay the same egg like like the spots and you know which hen is laying that egg? Um, yeah, I, I've never really tracked it, but I have heard that hens lay basically the same pattern uh, every time, but I can't say for sure because I've never really tracked it. I can, I can take eggs from two days and tell which ones are laid by the same hen, but I couldn't tell you which hen in the, in the cage right. those two eggs are from. Uh, Jen says, hello from Humboldt, California. Let's see, not for me. Okay, Chris says, what is the Arkansas quail group called? I missed it, and are they on social media? It's on Facebook. It's called Arkansas Caternix Quail Breeders. Robin says, uh, LOL at Beth Reed, I cannot wait to talk quail with you and dogs too. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, Robin. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I, there's so it many is. people that I want to see and meet and talk with. and I mean, I, I talk to a lot of people now online and on Facebook and whatnot, but uh, it's going to be nice to be face to face. Uh, only one says, with the price of feed going up, how can people supplement or offset? Uh, what are you doing in that case, Beth? I don't feed more, higher protein than I need to. Mm -hmm. Protein is the most expensive component of the feed, typically. Right. So as soon as I start getting eggs, I start moving them to a lower protein feed. Um, that's pretty much all I do. Uh, that and try to come up with feeders that they can't scoop feed out of. <laughs> Okay, there's Zach's phone number. It's 937-760-7282. Dixie Living Homestead says, love your haircut, Beth. Thank you. There's there's my crazy dog going uh, crazy. Got a big dog bark. Yeah, he does. He thinks he's tough. Uh, Rose says, hi, I just started and I'm trying to build up my stock. What would you suggest to increase my hatch rate? Because my chicks are fully developed and fluffy inside the eggs, but never hatched. Yeah, that can be an issue. I would really watch your uh, humidity. Uh, if they're going full, full term and can't get out of the egg, um, humidity can be an issue. One thing uh, that I heard that I found really helpful is if your eggs don't develop, that's typically either a shipping issue or a fertility issue. Mm -hmm. If they develop partway and die, it's probably a temperature issue within the incubator, um, which may be that it's just fluctuating too much, even if the average temperature is right. And if they fully form but, but don't hatch, it's probably humidity. Yeah. Um, I did a video a while back, probably a year or so ago, that uh, shows you all the... Uh, De developmental stages of the chicks and when they die and the most probable cause. So if you can find that video on our channel, um, I think it would help you out quite a bit. Uh, I bet Verna will have the link up there in a minute. <laughs> I'm sure she will. Uh, but as far as um, fully developed and fluffy inside the eggs, um, it, it sounds like they couldn't pip and just suffocate it in the egg. Um, okay, uh, Ed Got Bait says only one look into growing duckweed. Okay, I guess that would be a good supplement. Robert says I have a hen that lays an egg in her spots. The spots on the eggs look the same every day. The pattern looks the same as that normal. Yeah, we just uh, discussed that a minute ago. Yep. 
Okay, Verna says, sounds uh, like too low of humidity at lockdown. I agree. Yep. That inner membrane is really tough if it's dry. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, Orlando says, how long can you keep eggs before incubating? Um, I never keep mine more than seven days. I've heard you can go up to ten. But, um, People have hatched eggs that they bought at the grocery store. So, yeah. um, you know, which are usually 45 days old or so before they ever hit the shelf. So you'll get mm -hmm. some, even with older eggs, but the longer you wait, the lower your hatch rate. Right. So I, I try to put them in the incubator within a week. Okay, not for me. Not for me. Okay, DJ Holly says hi. I just, I have just a new. I have, just, I just have a new incubator. I guess um, my last batch, three died two days before they were due to hatch. Managed to keep the temperature and humidity spot on, but I'm confused on the egg turner I'm using, an Amazon incubator. There are dozens of Amazon incubators. It's really hard yeah. to, to say much. Um, you got a new incubator. Um, there's another thing. I, I've seen this happen a couple times, and I, I kind of advise people against it. People are hatching chicks out in the egg turners. I don't recommend that. I would take the eggs out of the egg turner, put them in a hatching box or tray. Um, it's going to be a lot mm -hmm. easier on your chicks because if they get... They hatch out in that egg turner and they kind of get around. They could fall down either between the, the rails or outside the thing. And yeah, it's not really a good idea. Yeah, I use and I don't a, know if you said you were doing that. But. I use an app on my phone to track my incubation dates and when lockdowns start and that kind of thing. And I put in a date wrong once and I had them hatch that. in the turner. And I had several with broken necks from the turner. So yeah, it, you know, the turner was still turning, and yep, I had the same thing yep. happen one time. Yep. Uh, Yeti says, "How much did it cost you to get started with breeding and keeping quail?" <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> to start, yeah. it's not that expensive, but it grows fast. That's where so I, ran I start. <laughs> I started with an inexpensive used incubator. I uh, got a really bad hatch rate with it, but I got started, and a Sterilite tub brooder, and built my first cage from from salvaged wood. So I, right. I started fairly inexpensively, but it does grow fast. Yeah, and that that was and my easy. problem. It's <laughs> easy. And it's I easy to out, start. I started out. I think I hatched out uh, 60 eggs, and I'm like, oh, this is easy. And then my next order was 300 eggs. You know, so. Yep. Uh, and then the next thing you'd look up and you've got, you know, cages everywhere and birds everywhere. Yeah. And no time to scratch. Robin C. says, my dogs love raw quail. I wish my dog would. I mean, it's okay that he eats it cooked, but at least he's eating it. <coughs> Excuse me. That is Here's not a, a COVID one. cough, by the way. I have a sinus <laughs> infection. Here's a good one for you, uh... Beth, what is the difference between a Jumbo White and a Texas A&M? A Texas A&M would have been a, a type of Jumbo White. Texas A&M no longer exists. Um, that was a specific bloodline from Texas A&M University. Uh, it has not been maintained in a pure form, and so they're not out there anymore. Yeah, you'll hear that term, <coughs> Texas A&M and Jumbo Whites, going around pretty quickly. Uh, Robert says, I would like to find out who's got the biggest Jumbo Quail out there so I can get a start if I can ask that question. There's, I tell you what, if you want really Jumbo Quail, go to Australia. They have, you know, 16 pound, 16 they have massive 16 birds. ounces, yeah. yeah, they got some big ones, but um, well, there's I've a few breeders in the States. Size. Yeah, there's a few breeders uh, in the States that got some big quail. The problem when you start getting up close to a pound is that you start having leg and joint problems. Leg issues, yep. So you have to breed you have to breed for heavier bone first and then add the size. Uh, let's see. Jesse says we've been having storms all afternoon here in Iowa. I'm out delivering pizza while listening. Uh, been having to detour around fallen trees and a couple down power lines. Wow, be careful out there, Jesse. 
Stay safe. But I'm glad you're dedicated enough to uh, listen to the live stream while you're driving. It's not stormy here. You could bring me a pizza. There you go. Uh, Delana says, I can hear Terry's dog saying, I'd like my quail medium rare, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I even have to peel it off the bone for him. Uh, talk about spoils. Well, it, cooked poultry bone is not good for dogs. Right. So that's, that's better that, that you do right. that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Hilda says, what is the appropriate ratio uh, male to female. Um, I too breed them for my dog. He loves them and the eggs. Depends on the male. Um, the The fewest that I've been able to do is three to one um, without having hens that are just beaten up so badly from overbreeding. Mm -hmm. um, but I have had males that it took eight to keep them satisfied enough to, to where they were peaceful. So you, I usually recommend people start at four or five to one and then adjust by adding females if they need to. Okay. Uh, Jasmine says, I do pine pellets as well. Okay. Uh, Linda says, Beth, do you feed your dog the whole bird, bones and all? If so, would that be safe for a nine pound dog? You have to teach your dog to chew the bone rather than swallowing big chunks of bone. Um, so for a nine pound dog, you would probably need to grind it, um, at least for a while. But right. yes, I feed it skin and, and guts and bone and feathers, and all I do is, is uh, a bloodless cull and freeze them whole. So. Okay, DJ Holly says, new Amazon incubator, 16 egg one. It says I can turn them every 90 minutes, but confused on the confused on to the 200 second turn quails only need turns so far, don't they? Do you understand that so question you're, at all, Beth? Um, I'm, I'm kind of lost on that one. I'm not sure if Holly, let us know if if that's one where the eggs are laying on their side, or if they're upright. So if they're upright, they should be turned just gently kind of tipped back and forth. If they're on their side, then they can be rotated about 90 degrees each time. Yeah, I don't know. Some of those... And usually, uh, usually three, to, three to six times a day is, yeah. is what most people recommend for turning. I and wouldn't do it every 90 minutes. incubators that you get on Amazon are, are Chinese produced and they're not really good at their manuals. I bought some stuff on there that... Yes. I mean, the... Uh, the translations are a little uh, sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell it's translated. Uh, let's see, Katrina says, Terry, try putting a quail in the pot, put it on the stove, turn it off, stir it every once in a while, then give it to them. I've done this for dogs that want people food and it worked great. Wow. So that kind of uh, reverse psychology for my dog. It's worth a try. I'll try it. You yeah. might also try um, when you get the poodle, mm -hmm. is giving a piece of raw quail to the poodle and see if he'll eat it. And sometimes the competition of being fed at the same time will start yeah. a meeting. Oh yeah, if if I feed him like his dry food and he won't eat, mm -hmm. I'll call the cat. And as soon as I call the cat, he's over at yep. his bowl eating. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, uh, this is Richard, not Trudy Maddox from Clinton, Arkansas. Where is Beth from? Where are you from, Beth? I'm about half an, I'm originally from California, but right now I'm about half an hour north of Batesville. Okay. And Cave City. Uh, let's see, only one says, my first batch got killed by dogs, didn't even eat them, so I repaired and reinforced. Do I put traps out? I'd be careful about putting oh. traps out because, I mean, unless they're live traps, because you can get in trouble. Uh, at least around yeah. here, we can. We can get in big trouble for trapping animals inhumanely. Yeah. Um, sometimes things that are allowed for trapping wildlife, if you catch a pet in it, uh, it's considered cruelty. Um, I am a huge advocate for that electric poultry netting. Um, I have lost more birds in the decades that I've been keeping poultry to dogs and usually dogs that are 
family pets from somebody down the road than to every other cause combined. Mm -hmm. You know, there have been times, there was once I came home and I had lost an entire flock of birds, uh, close to 40 birds uh, in one afternoon to a pair of dogs that were just having a great old time, you know. um, Yeah, when I let my dog outside in the backyard, first thing he does is runs over to the aviary, stares in the door and goes into a full point and he'll be there for 15 <laughs> minutes just pointing mm-hmm. at all the birds. I'm like, oh, yeah, big dummy. Uh, let's see. If taking two to four birds for meat each week, how many birds do you need to have and not deplete your stock? Two to four each well, week. Is, you do the math. You, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hatching from one hen that lays six eggs a week would provide you that many chicks, um, but I don't really recommend only having one hen. Right. No, you and you would have to have because they're pulling out four birds each week, and you yes, need but to, if you if birds you birds need eight weeks to grow up. Right, but once you're in production, if you right. are hatching, if you're hatching from one hen each week, that would give you that many birds, gotcha. probably. Yep. Um, I'm not good. With I would say I would say I would say a single breeding group would do it, but I hate to have a single breeding group because if something happens to your only rooster, right. you're out of production. So, yep. okay, A. Jones says hi, Terry and Beth, checking in from the northeast tip of Ohio. Um, Hello, glad you're here. Okay, the Rochelle Farm says, I can't make QuailCon this year. We have a family vacation, same weekend. I did donate uh, to try and help. Um, we appreciate the donations, and we'll see you next year. We'll miss you this year, and see you next time. Yep. Not me. Not me. Uh, Hilda says, what is the ratio of uh, male to female? <laughs> it varies. Um, I aim for one to five, but um, I have had groups that I got by with less females and groups where I needed significantly more. So you just, the quail didn't read that number, so you have to base it on their behavior, not not on a preset idea of what will work. Okay, Rick says, so looking at that website, I think he was looking at uh, Southwest Game Birds. It seems I have a polygenic phenotypes because I have, I got a large variation of colors. Okay, I'm, well, I'm glad that helped you out then. Uh, a. Jones says, late to the show tonight. Cleaning quail cages, ha? Huh? Yep, I know the feeling. <laughs> but welcome anyhow. Yeah. Troy says, Beth, what automatic waters do you use for your quail and where do you get them? I use the really cheap red plastic uh, cups without the nipple in them that you buy on eBay. Okay. Um, I think I got a bag of 20 of them for about $25. Um, they're very similar to the rent a coop ones that are sold on Amazon, mm-hmm. uh, but they're a little bit flimsier. Um, you need to make sure you put them in a spot where the birds can't crawl on top of them or they'll bust them up. Right. Is that the one where they go down as the uh, birds are drinking mm-hmm. and then they come back up? Or the other way around? I think um, well, yeah, the other way around. Gotcha. Yeah, I haven't tried those ones yet. Uh, let's see. Robert says, how do you keep your eggs longer than, say, a month? Are you I don't. talking eating eggs or hatching eggs? Yeah, if, if it's hatching eggs, I don't, I don't keep them longer than seven days before they go in the incubator. Uh, if they're eating eggs, um, they, I usually I don't keep, keep those them that the long either. For, Really? The, the quality starts to degrade. Yeah. Um, if they they start to dehydrate even inside in the refrigerator and right. and they get I, a little I'm gummy. I'm sure I've had I've had eggs. It's usually about three weeks that I'll keep eggs in the fridge for eating. But I'm pretty sure I've had them past you know at least at, at a month. Um, yeah, I I get enough eggs that I don't see any need to yeah, eat, eat them gummy. fresh. That's the way and, I am. So I and put them out these, for the crows. Uh, that's what I do. We have this crow. I yep. call him Bumblefoot because he's got a foot like this, and uh, mm-hmm. he comes over. He loves the eggs. The crows okay. 
here are real good about chasing hawks away from my chickens. Oh, cool. So I, I feed them quail eggs to keep them coming around. Uh, Ritka says, I have chicks like that with the head down. I heard it's rye neck vitamin E deficiency. Okay, that was it, probably to that question earlier. Yeah, rye neck can be vitamin E, B12, or selenium deficiency, but not straight out of the egg. That takes time to develop those deficiencies. If it's straight out of the egg, it's almost always an incubator problem. Okay, Del Choo Choo says, Hi, Terry and Beth. What's the youngest that you've seen a quail hen lay an egg? Five weeks, I think. Yeah, I had one lay an egg right right before five weeks, like a day or two before that once. Okay. Um, and then she didn't lay again for another week. Uh, La Rochelle Farm says, Also, Beth and Verna, thank you for the effort you guys put in here and at my shire. Exactly. We do appreciate it. Oh, Enjoy we got another, doing it. Uh, we got another donation. Jordan made a super chat donation. Appreciate it. I'm just writing all this down so I know what to tell Zach. Uh, not for me, not for me. Ron says, my wife will not be able to attend QuailCon because of our because our home sold, so you can give that ticket to someone who can use it. Um, okay, Ron, uh, if you would, either text or call Zach and let him know. Um, I'm sure he would appreciate it. Um, and congratulations on the sale. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Breeway, hope I said that right, Turnix Quail Farm says, my quail are three months old. The eggs have decreased significantly. I noticed today that they seem to be molting. Is this normal? So young, and how long does molting last? This is Patricia from Arkansas. Go ahead, Beth. That is early to be going into a full molt. It may be the, the changes in weather that we've had lately. We've had mm -hmm. some extreme heat and then suddenly very cool and temperate. Um, I would suspect that's what's going on. Um, you can up their protein for a bit to help them through the molt a little bit faster. Uh, sometimes they'll molt when they're stressed as well. Was there more to that question? I can't see it anymore. Uh, <laughs> no, well, is it normal so young and how long does okay. it last? Uh, molting can last anywhere from about a month to several months depending on the bird. I, mm -hmm. I have heard that about six weeks is normal. Uh, at what age do you separate the roosters? As soon as I can tell them apart. Um, Katrina says, good answer about why you are raising colors. Uh, do what you like. Sorry about that, guys. My throat is dry. We have that Saharan dust over top of us right now. Mm. And it's really, oh, it tears up my throat. It's like I got a tickle back there I can't get rid of. Uh, Jen says, is there a certain breed that's better to start with when you first start off? Jumbo I would wilds. recommend, I always tell everybody get Jumbo Wilds just to to get you into it. I mean, it's, a, it's an all-around utility breed. Um, good for eggs, good for meat. Easy to sell. Good, easy to sell. Yeah. yeah, all that stuff. Third time around says, "Is it black soldier fly larva that looks like maggots in my quail poop trays?" If Maybe. it looks like maggots, it probably is maggots. <laughs> uh, black yeah, soldier fly larva are, are really different from a maggot. Yeah, they almost yeah. remind me a little bit of a leech the way they're shaped. Yeah, they're, they're kind of flattened kind of, on, the, on the top. Mm-hmm. Not as wet looking, obviously. But. Delana says, Terry, the standards are super smart. Oh, up two They points. are. Okay, yep. Yep. Actually, Rick all the says, sizes are very smart. Right. As long as it's smarter than the dog I have, we're fine. No, I can't. He's not <laughs> stupid. He's, he's probably playing me, but... 
<laughs> Let's see. Ricka says my solid floor cages get stinky very fast. Yep, just clean them more often. Yep. It, it really, the type of bedding you're using makes a huge difference in that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people use wood shavings and they tend to kind of flatten out and make a solid layer that the poop can't get down right. through. And so they build up and get dirty and stinky and wet really fast. Moisture is where the odor tends to come from. So you right. want something that will absorb the moisture. And that's why I like those pellets so much. Yep. And it helps to have a good air circulation around. It kind of dries everything out before it becomes a, a stinky issue. I mean, my cages, um, I can let the manure build up, you know, three or four days, walk out in the shop and still not smell anything. It's just because I have fans mm -hmm. circulating, you know, the air all the time. So. Right. If I change my cages once a week, I never smell them. Right. Uh, Don says, is there any way to help prevent those little dried balls at the end of the quail's toes around the toenail? I don't yes. have that issue. Yes, clean more often. It's 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 a ball of dried poop, and okay, it happens when poop. Okay. yeah yeah when they're walking in it. Uh, again, it's moisture is what helps it build up. So anytime your bedding is moist is moist is, or wet, it's a problem, and they need to be cleaned. Okay, Steve says I've kept I've kept quail in my living room, no problem. Yep, if you do if you keep them well, it shouldn't be an issue. Oh, okay, here's, uh, Billy says, from the quail shed, Opelika, Alabama. Ah, okay. That Sorry about that, Billy. Uh, Ritka says, I put a GoPro in the hutch to see which hen laid which egg. Okay. Uh, let's see. I can't tell all my hens apart. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> Those jungle uh, wilds look a whole lot alike. <laughs> right. I have a couple that are really friendly. I mean, they'll come right to the door when I open up, especially if I'm giving them greens or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're right there and trying to come out of the cage. and. Mm -hmm. whatnot, but. Uh, Jordan says, are there any fruits, bugs, vegetables, etc. you can feed to create a deeper or darker yolk or improve the taste? What's your thought um, on dark yellow yolks? Dark yellow yolks come from feeding uh, things that are high in, um, gosh, my mind just went blank, chlorophyll. So dark leafy greens is what makes the biggest difference in that. Uh, things with beta carotene will also help. So uh, dark oranges and, and yellows. Uh, mine love chickweed. I, I pluck that and give to them fairly often. Dandelion greens are great, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, protein doesn't do really anything. Good. Protein doesn't do anything for egg color. Um, it will make eggs bigger, but it doesn't change the color. Um, as far as flavor, stay away from anything that's got a strong taste of its own, because that will affect the flavor of the eggs. Okay. Orlando says, hi, Billy Bell from Opelika, Alabama. I'm down the road in Phoenix City. Okay, we wouldn't even talk now, so. Um, Steve says, anyone supplement their feed with cat food? I do not. That's just... Yeah, that's just adding protein, um, which again, once they're, they've reached adulthood, they don't need high protein anymore, so right. you're raising the expense without necessarily meeting their real nutritional needs. So um, I have done that with chicks in the past. I used catfish food, but when I couldn't get game bird food, that's a way to bring the protein up, but for adults, I don't. Uh, Russell says, "Are quail profitable, and or are quail profitable for you? And is the market strong, weak, or flooded? <laughs> How is it out there?" Yeah. You know, I don't sell a lot of quail, so um, I sell a few here and there, mostly to mostly in breeder groups to other people that are getting into quail, um, but mostly I have them for the dog, to feed the dog. So if I compared what it would cost me to buy that much raw meat to feed him, I think that we're we're more than breaking even, <clears throat> but I haven't actually done the math, so. Um, as far as mine are, um, my quail pay for themselves. Um, I have enough of a market down here, uh, whether it's hatching eggs, eating eggs, uh, live birds. Um, 
the best thing, when I first started out, I was shipping. I got MPIP certified, AI clean, and I was shipping out of the state. But my market here in Florida, around in my local area is so good that I don't really need to ship anymore. So, um, I am, a, yeah. um, I'm certified to, to do NPIP testing, but I haven't oh, yeah? okay. certified my flock. Right. So, um, word of mouth I can do 90 day certificates. Yeah. yeah. Well, once people find out that, you know, you're selling eating eggs or hatching eggs or even live birds, the word gets out there pretty soon. You'll have more customers you know, than you can service. Well, that's somewhat dependent on where you live. Right. That there's there's a very very tiny market for anything where I am. So. Oh really? Wow. Yeah, I live in a county with less than ten thousand people in the entire county. Oh okay. And uh, county seat has less than two thousand people in it. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, I could have I could have three hundred birds or five thousand birds, and I'd still be able to sell everything that I was producing. Um, yeah, I'm not willing to work that hard. <laughs> I don't want that many birds, and I don't have enough room for that many birds. Uh, Val says, a hen will lay an egg with the same pattern all her life. I've had quail 20 years and tracked it for a month once. Okay, well, interesting. I wonder why that is. Uh, third time around, says it cost me $4 to start. I already had an incubator and a hatcher for my chickens. That's pretty cheap. Uh... Chad's in the house. He says, hi, gang, running late. Hope everyone is well. Welcome, Welcome Chad. Chad. Glad you can make it. Verna says, how do you get heavier bones? You select Good question, for it. Verna. Yep. Um, I was actually doing that before I went and got rid of most of my birds. I was actually using taking a micrometer and miking out the top of the, the above the joint, um, trying mm -hmm. to build a stronger bone for a heavier meat bird. Um, mm -hmm. but that project's on hold for now. Oliver Cole says, is it beneficial to ferment chick's feed or is that only for adults? Also medicated or unmedicated chick feed? Um, when I, my youngest chicks don't get the fermented feed. They'll start getting it when they're tall enough to, and it's usually around three weeks, uh, to where they can eat out of one of the shoebox type feeders. And, uh, I use unmedicated feed when I'm feeding my chicks, um, but I heard that medicated won't hurt them. Um, what do you think, Beth? I I don't do fermented feed, so I can't speak to that. Um, yeah. I don't medicate anything that's not ill. Right. So um, I I learned many many years ago from an old chicken guy, been keeping chickens forever. Um, he taught me what he did to prevent coccidiosis with his chickens. Mm -hmm. And I do that with my chickens and quail both. And I've never had an outbreak here, so I don't medicate anybody for it. Even my quail that are on the ground don't get coccidiosis. Right. So ba basically, if anybody's interested, when they're two weeks or so old, you pluck a small, um, a handful of, of grass or something with the roots and the soil mm -hmm. still attached to it, and you put it in the brooder. And you start out with something maybe an inch and a half, two inches in diameter. And then every couple of days you do that again, each time getting a little bit bigger. And it allows them to be exposed to whatever's in the soil without being exposed to an overwhelming amount. And so they build up some resistance. Yeah, good idea. I think I, when I first got my uh, silkies, this was years ago, I read that somewhere. And I, I did that too. I went out after they hatched out. I went out and... Uh, got a chunk of grass with dirt on it and threw it in their little brooder and they, they had a love blast it with it yeah they had a blast jl murphy says my first hatch was killed by a raccoon i'm in the city oh that's a shame yeah people don't realize how many predators are around in town here's another one uh third time around says i just lost 30 birds this month to snakes wow hmm Oliver Cole says, when separating into breeding groups, is it best to pick birds with like visual traits or very different? Is it a preference or beneficial, for example, that people keep EB with EB and fawn with fawn? I'll let you take that one, Beth. It depends on the specific 
colors you're working with. So like fawn to fawn, you you get more fawns and you get Manchurians and, and so that's nice to do. I don't breed blue to blue or silver to silver because you get kind of a dingy white and at least the ones that I've had have seemed to be a little fragile and um, and that's not a color that I like well enough to try to breed it and strengthen it and continue with it. Sorry about that guys. Um, so it, it just kind of depends on what trait you're breeding for. Um, I breed like my blues that are EB based I'm I try to breed them to EB um, my blues that are Pharaoh based I tend to breed to Pharaohs but I breed Tibetans and Pharaohs together too okay. um, because yeah. I think it strengthens the Tibetans to do that so uh, let's see okay Jordan uh, $20 super sticker uh, Shiba Dog in Samurai Armor, waving banner, saying number one. Cool. <laughs> Appreciate that, Jordan. Uh, let's see, Jordan says, uh, thank you for your help. I've got all the hardware, but doing my last bits of research before putting eggs into the incubator. Okay. Lynn says, what precise angle is required for quail eggs to roll out effectively without having eggs break on the front? Uh, like I said earlier, um, I have a 24-inch uh, front-to-back measurement, and it's a two-inch drop. So actually, it's an inch and three quarters drop. Uh, JL Murphy says 11 degrees. Okay, there you go. Uh, Robert says, "What freeze-proof water setup do you recommend, or should I just insulate my coop?" I don't have a need for that, so. <laughs> I'm, I move mine inside so I don't have to worry about freezing water. Um, gotcha. But that's because my health issues make being out dealing with water in the cold difficult. Um, don't insulate your coop. It restricts ventilation. Ventilation is way more important than heat. Um, but some people will will use an automatic waterer and wrap the lines with like the heat tape like you can mm -hmm. wrap your pipes with. I've heard of several different versions of that. That would be another good one to go onto Facebook and one of the the Caternix Corner group or the the Newbie Quail Lovers group and ask other people what they do. Yeah. I know we've got some Canadian quail keepers on both of those groups that are very experienced in dealing with the cold. Actually, Kristen could probably tell you more about that, too. Yeah. She's it's pretty chilly where she lives. lives. Yep. Uh, I don't have that problem down here. Uh, no. He we... says... <laughs> Go ahead. Nope. Sorry. I was just agreeing with you. Okay. J.L. Murphy says, do quail lay fairy eggs like chickens do? Yes, I've had some yep. that laid the little baby eggs. Yep. About the size of a jelly bean. <clears throat> Orlando says, do you ever get a soft shell egg? Yes. Yep. I have a couple of hens that lay them pretty consistently. I think they just don't metabolize calcium real well. I don't worry too much about it, though, because it's a self-limiting thing. They won't reproduce because those will never go in the incubator. Right. Thrifty Builder says, Beth, what's your last name? I would like to get with you for some quail. I live close to you. Um, Verna, I think, posted uh, the link to my Facebook profile. Uh, in the chat, so you should be able to just click on that and find me on Facebook. Okay. Oliver My last says, name's Reed, though. Right. Yeah, I didn't know if I should say that or not, but I guess I No, it's did. fine. <laughs> uh, Oliver Cole says, how often would you recommend breeding outside of the line or color line, uh, specifically with silvers? I know they are prone to genetic issues. Hmm. Um, it really depends on your program. So I am a spiral breeder typically, um, but I, I do, in my spiral, I have two clans of blue and one of pharaoh, or one of Tibetan, depending on, on which color I'm working on, uh, uh, or which base I'm working with. So um, about every third generation, it, you, you get that 
rotation in there. Right. But yeah, I don't I'm have not, cages that are all blue. None of them are all blue. You know, it's always the male doesn't match the females. But that's because of that specific color. Um, yeah, when I had uh, Perry Schofield on, um, he was saying that he goes three and four generations and doesn't even worry about it. You know, and he does just fine. So. Yeah, and, you know, other types of poultry with spiral breeding, there are bloodlines of Rhode Island Reds that have been kept with with three groups in the spiral for over a hundred years and they're perfectly healthy genetically. So, you know, it just depends on how well you're doing your culling so that you're not passing on bad genes. Right. Uh, Delana says he's just goofy. That what makes the lab breed cute. And here's one, <laughs> Doug. <laughs> Doug says, Terry, I think your dog may be training you. I think you're right, Doug. <laughs> I tell people every minute you're with your dog, you're training him. You're either training him to do something you want him to do, or you're accidentally training him to do something you don't want him to do. Right. When I first got him, we got him at like seven weeks old. Um, mm -hmm. I was really working with him, you know, right up through maybe four months. Um, and then we took him to the vet one time, and the vet x-rayed his hindquarters, and turns out he has no sockets on his hips. Um, oh, no. So the bones are just free-floating in there. So I felt sorry for right. him, so I kind of laid off the, especially stuff where he has to sit, you know, because you can see it's it's painful for him to get okay. up, so. Um, oh, man, I hate uh, that for you. Yeah. Well, he, he'll never be bred, you know, or used again, but. Uh, let's see. I mean, he does fine. I mean, I, I got him off of all the uh, painkillers and stuff, and I exercise Good. him regularly, so. But he's just goofy. Robert says, you guys prefer to build your own quail cages or buy the comfort cage? I build. Um, I'm a cheapskate. I build. Yep. Me too. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the comfort class cage. Um, they're just, nope. they're pricey. If they, if they work for you, they're, they're a great system. The, the nice thing about buying something like that <clears throat> is that, like, it took me building three separate setups before I had perfected what I wanted yep. with my cages yep. you know so you start out you know with right. exactly they what you need they did all the homework for you yep. they did all the homework <clears throat> uh, Delana says Beth what would you consider is keeping them well I definitely want to hear that Wait. what all would you consider is keeping them well so keeping them in appropriate groups so they're not stressed and fighting all the time uh, keeping cages properly sized and clean, fresh food and water in front of them, um, you know, all, all those things. Um, stress is probably the biggest thing, and cleanliness. Um. Okay, um, we are getting down to the bottom of the questions. Um, we do got it's. We're going on two hours, so we really need to <laughs> get through these. Um, Oliver says, sorry for so many questions. As always, Terry, you are my favorite to ask. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we hope to help. Robert says, uh, you guys prefer to build your own cages or buy, I think we just answered that one. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Orlando says, my wife has been bugging me to ask, does anybody else's roosters yell Cobra Kai all day long? I think mine yell, look at me, look at that's me. That's what mine, that's exactly what mine say. Look at me, look at me. Uh, okay, not for me. Walter says, can you tell me where to find a hatchery online that sells Jumbo Caternix chicks? Um, I would call um, Zach over at Myshire Farm. I'm not sure, does he ship chicks or just um, I, I think he I think he ships them at three weeks old. I don't think he okay. ships like day olds. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and I would. Of Zach. I would not buy and have shipped day olds. They're too fragile at that age. Right. Okay. Katrina says, uh, and Verna put the link up there. Okay. Good. Uh, Doug says lost around two thousand bob whites when a fox got in and couldn't find his way out. Ooh, ran most of them to death. Wow. That's crazy. Again, that electric poultry netting is, is awesome stuff. Yeah. I'm lucky. It, I'm in an area where I really don't have too many predators. You know, maybe a neighborhood yeah. cat. But, 
uh, if if the, with us where we are we're on the on the a hillside with eight and a half acres of woods on our property with every kind of wildlife you can think of yeah. and as long as the fence is on and charged properly we do not worry about ground-based predators at all right. no okay rapscallion says at what level should the water line full of at what level should the water line full of nipples be i plan on putting a line inside the cage no oh, i, I would how high is your bucket up or no how high is the water line for the birds okay yeah, there's a couple of different styles of nipples. Some of them have to be vertical, and some of them have to be horizontal. Right. Um, but I wouldn't put them in the cage. I would put them where the birds have to put their head out of the cage, or they will be bumping those things and flooding the cage constantly. <laughs> um, and you're, you're exactly right, because I have those out in my aviary, and there's a spot mm -hmm. underneath the uh, all the water nipples that is wet. And I think mm -hmm. the biggest problem is I have my bucket up so high that there's a lot of pressure on the nipples. So when they hit right. it, it, it showers them. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll modify that. And in that. the summertime, just, they like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think they just play in it most of the days. Yeah, but then you've got moisture in your cage. So you've got odor and, and right. wet feet, which can yeah. lead to bumblefoot and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, Scara says, I hang a heat lamp over my water. Works fine for Michigan. Uh, during a polar vortex. There you go. That's a good way to keep the water thought out. Oh, Doug, okay, wants to know if Doug got the fox. Uh, how hard would it be to make jumbo silvers? I don't think it'd be that hard. Yeah, I, th I think it's Perry's just, done it. I would imagine it's a multi-generation project, but there right. shouldn't be anything inherently difficult about it. Yeah, Oliver, I'll, I'll tell you what, go on uh, Katernik's Corner on the main channel and look up that uh, interview with Perry. Uh, he talks a lot about making jumbo-sized silvers and how he did it. Uh, I'm taking my fib. Uh, Rep Scullion says, I missed your answer. What's the best angle for the rollout cage? Like I said, mine have an inch and three-quarter inch drop in two feet. Uh, somebody else said um, 11 degrees. So. Uh, here's a question for you, Beth. Isn't the New Hampshire <laughs> Red just breeding the best of the Rhode Island Reds? No. Um, it is taking Rhode Island Reds and breeding them to be more meat-focused rather than, than balanced between meat and eggs. Uh, Delana says, thanks, Beth. I don't know. Must have been a question. You I don't know what about. I did, but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, <clears throat> Oliver says, are there benefits to having non-jumbo birds? You can take that. You work with the colors. Um, in my personal experience, they're less likely to prolapse. Uh, and s a lot of them are slightly better layers than the jumbos are. Mm -hmm. Um if you only want birds for eggs and don't plan on eating them then yeah go go with the standards um, yeah. uh rose says my quail say don't come back <laughs> that's good <laughs> uh okay rap scouting says vertical nipples okay um all right that brings us down to the bottom of the questions and we're not going to take any more because it's going on nine o'clock and uh Beth's been here all night. I feel sorry for her. <laughs> um, so, guys, um, one more time. If you want to get a ticket to QuailCon, uh, you'll notice on the MyShire Farm website that they're no longer available. But if you call Zach, he will um, hook you up with tickets. Um, let's see, what else was there? Uh, well, the show's over with, so we're not taking any more donations. I do want to say that this is the last live stream until after QuailCon. I am not going live next week. Um, I've got a real busy schedule um, that I have to uh, get some stuff done before going to QuailCon. i got to pick up a rental car and whatnot. Uh, okay, Verna says... Uh, okay, Verna just posted our winner for the Tumblr 
and that is going to go to Breeway Caternix Quail Farm. Um, so, uh, Breeway, if you're still listening, um, send me an email to terry at caternixcorner.com with your shipping information or over on uh, the Facebook group page. You can message me there, either one. Um, let's see if there's any more questions. Okay, Zach's phone number. Um, so, congratulations, and I'll get that Tumblr out to you ASAP. Um, Berna, I want to say thank you very much for moderating again today. Okay, yeah, she just put up uh, my email address. And uh, Beth, and Verna, thank you, would you so much. I'm Go sorry, ahead. Verna, would you mind putting my Facebook um, info there again for anybody that needs to reach out to me about anything we talked about tonight? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, sorry, yeah, thank Beth, you for having me, Terry. No, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Two hours you've gone above and beyond <laughs> so ah, um, it's earlier here than there <laughs> oh is it okay uh, yeah i gotta go yeah. make me some dinner i haven't eaten yet so guys i want to thank you all for the great questions uh thanks for joining us tonight thanks for hitting that like button we've got 64 watching and 64 likes so we did pretty good um i hope to see you guys all at QuailCon. uh to turn the corner is going to be shut down until after that so um have a good night and we'll see y'all later